there's a great example of this um, in nature. There's a so there's a cuttlefish, right? It's you, you know what they are. They're kind of like combination of a snail and a squid. So the females are smaller than the males, and and during mating season, the females basically go down to the bottom of the uh, of the just off the ocean floor. And up above them, the males are competing for dominance. It's the same thing as watching, you know, rams or deers bash their horns right, together. Right. They're competing for, for dominance. There's the, the big ones and the strong ones, and they're flashing all these colors and all the rest of this stuff. Well, as it turns out, researchers found that the smallest of the male cuttlefish, the ones that were just through randomness, were not born very big or very strong or very powerful, pull in and sink to the bottom. In other words, they act like females. They don't do battle with the males at all. They sneak past them. They, they basically make themselves as small as possible because they're aware of the fact that they cannot compete up here with these, with these males that are fighting for dominance. Ah. And so they just basically act like females, float down to the bottom, and then they are good to go. So and they become like soy boy fish, where they become gonna... soy boy fish, but They'll... they but they get the shot, right? I mean, they 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 get the chicks. They get the chicks. And and how many times have you seen this? How many times have you seen these soy boys basically talking about how how awful men are and stuff? Because they're basically just trying to get laid. You know, they're sur they're, they're just surrounded by these these angry, hostile young women, and they think that if we if we like acquiesce to them, that'll make them happy. It's like it's like you're going to do this girl's homework for you, so she'll, so she'll be your, uh, your girlfriend. doesn't work like that. I spent my early 20s because it was the 70s, right? And then it was the, the 80s, the, the late 70s, early 80s when I was in my 20s in Southern California. I spent my t time doing that, trying to, you know, oh, I don't want to, if I, you know, if I was to slap her on the ass or try to kiss her or whatever, that would be disrespectful. I got to, you know, try to draw her out, f you know, mm -hmm. find out what she's about. My best friend was a guy named Glenn and Glenn, I named my son after him, by the way, <laughs> but at the time he would just, he was just full guy. He was just guy all the way and the women just flocked to him and I was doing all what I thought was right. And they didn't care about me because there was a real male in the room. Yep. And exactly. I, I didn't allow myself to become a male for several more years. I was exactly the same way. And it took me longer. Although needless to say, I've succeeded beyond anybody's wildest dreams. Uh, but, <laughs> but when I was in my twenties, I, there, I actually saw this with my own eyes, heard it with my own ears, went to a nightclub. I was in, Florida and went to a nightclub in um, Fort Lauderdale and me memory can be a funny thing, but this is how I remember it. There were a bunch of cocktail tables there in dark room and a dance floor that was, nobody was on. And there was this, 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 I remember very clear is this blonde woman in this white dress. And it seemed to me in memory that the only light in the room was on her. You know what I mean? It was almost <laughs> like a, like a museum piece. Like she was just absolutely stunning and stone cold and i i'm i'm not i'm not getting it I'm, i was way too way too insecure for that but i'm i'm sitting relatively close and i'm watching these guys coming up you know you're watching these guys like walking up to the table and they kind of lean in you know and they blah, blah, blah. and she just kind of shakes her head and then they go like sulking back you know she's just like she's just enjoying rejecting these guys and i the heard this with my own ears back to the corner yep heard this with this with my own ears with a guy who i who was a friend of a friend i didn't know him very well but he's watching this and he knocks a beer down or something and finally he just gets up and he gets up with a purpose you know and he walks over to this table and he says to her would you like to dance and she said no i don't think so and he said it's burned into my memory i'll never forget it and he said listen princess uh, Prince Charming's horse threw a shoe on the way over, so he's going to be a little bit late tonight. Uh, <laughs> now, do you want to dance or not? And she, like that, you know, like that. Love Prince it. Charming's horse, Prince Charming's horse threw a shoe on the way over, and he's going to be a little bit late tonight. And then 20 minutes later, they're out, they're gone together, you know. And and this is just one of many, 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 many things that conservatives understand that progressives it's not that they don't understand it. It's just that they, since they can't do it, they want to deny it and then they want to change the rules. Well, they think that it won't work and that they can't get away with it and they, they don't want to be witnessed doing it. It's too, it's too complicated for them, but inside they know it's true. I dated a, a woman for a while, very progressive. And, you know, I was being polite with her and she goes, uh, no, just really 
grab me and throw me on the couch. That's, there you go. That's what I'm looking yeah. for. Yeah. She knew in her own personal life that that's what she wanted. She wanted me, and then then I knew it was okay. I could be a guy around yep. her. And, and you know, you know, Bill. Really, the the thing that most human beings want to know is just where do they kind of fall within the dominance hierarchy. And right. the military is kind of genius in that way because a guy can come into your office, you know, if you're a lieutenant or whatever, and he's a captain, he yell at you, and you know, you have to, you have to take it. You have to be somewhere d- here in the dominance hi- hierarchy and understand that, and understand that the guy who's in charge is the one I should be following at any moment because he's he knows the stuff I don't know. And then the door closes, and you open your door, and you yell at the next guy down. You know what I mean? So, so somebody can be—that's a cartoonish version, but no, but that's exactly but, right. But a person can both be a, a follower and a leader. So, it, so it's balanced out. You know where you are in the tribe, and you can be comfortable there because you know I'm not going to be asked to do every single thing that's beyond my ability. But I'm going to be asked to do things that push my ability. I've got to have, I've got to live up to some stuff here. And in the military, they make it very plain for everybody. It's almost like a traffic sign. It's like, okay, so you've got um, one uh, bar on your collar, but I've got two. And that means that I get to tell you what to do. Now, that guy over there with that funny looking thing. What is that? It's an oak leaf cluster. Anyway, he tells me what to do. The guy with the bird on his collar gets to tell the guy with that funny looking thing what to do. And the guy with the star on his collar gets to tell the guy with the bird on his collar what to do. And this is how it works. And yes, and, and, it, is, and it sets up a system that people understand. Now, obviously, there are times, especially in peacetime, when the people who you are obligated to uh, take orders from and, and show respect to and mm-hmm. obedience to are on a level playing field outside of the military, certainly not worthy of that. They're, 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 they, they're just idiots or they're, or they're weak or they're stupid or whatever. But nevertheless, the system is in place because the system is in place. But right now we look at what's going on with the military and, and this is the atmosphere in which political officers rise. And if it turns out that you think you can be promoted by having the greenest base in the, in the country, we, uh, my friend Bert Rutan told me about this story about up in, uh, uh, Spokane, Air Force Base up there. He talked to the commanding general and he was so proud of the fact that he had the greenest base in the U.S. military. And and somebody said, well, how's your readiness? And he said, well, I don't know if it really matters, you know? So, so peace- look at our solar cre- array. Peacetime creates those kind of people. And we see it happening and everybody's filled with this despair. And I feel the despair, but I when I'm talking about being comfortable and competent, I'm, I know for, from looking backwards, that yes, it's it's horrible to watch, but when things get serious, those people will simply go away. And all of this frivolity and all of this nonsense will just simply burn off. These are luxury beliefs, this gender bathroom situation. These are beliefs and arguments that you can have when your society is so safe, so secure, and so prosperous, that you don't have to worry about the, 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 the hairy people from the, from the hill tribe, and you don't have to worry about today's food and so on. This is what you worry about when when everything is going swimmingly. People like conservatives know that this can't last forever. You just get weaker and weaker and then soon the, the hairy people from the mountain tribes come down. But when that happens, all of this stuff will just burn away and the people that we're gonna need to be presidents and, and, and commanders in the military and all the rest of it, they will show up, they always do. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it won't be pleasant, but it will, it will, it'll be survivable. And you know what's bizarre is that if you if you talk to people who've been through like really tough times, my dad, I'm sure your your parents too. My dad was a born in 25, so he grew up in the depression. Then he was in World War II. He got to Germany in April of 45, so he just got there just in time to see the war end. But he thought he was going to go to Japan and get killed on the invasion over there. Mm-hmm. And and all of this stuff is just kind of you know. What what do you have to deal with when you're when you're growing up? How much how much stress are you put under? How much pressure are you put under? And I guess that's really all I'm trying to say about it, you know? But you know, people have this this need to feel like there's some skin in the game. Uh, I I do these musical events and uh, my partner and I, Alexia, we were we were doing this monthly show and we were building this community. 
And at some point I said, you know what we need is we need an outside threat because we all come together and we watch music, but it's all nicey-nicey. There's no real, we're not going to cohere as a community until there's an outside threat. Yep. And, and I and I see people have done this with this COVID thing, you know. Oh I, my God! I call them the the branch Covidians. You know, they're, it's <laughs> their, their mask has become a holy vestment. It's uh, they they so took to this idea that we're all in existential peril that it it, it pulled something out of it, it gave them it, it turned them into preppers almost. Yep. <laughs> well, there's a lot I mean? of interesting. There's a lot of interesting dynamics there. Uh, I, I had I had lost my train of thought on that last thing there, and I got it back. And I, I and Great. Go what for I was it. Go for point it. I was trying to make was was that when you talk to people, once all these crises have passed, my mom grew up uh, in. She was born in '30, so she was in England during the Battle of Britain. And and when you hear people talk about it. Their, their fondest memories are usually about the toughest times. Those are usually the times that they, that they think of with the most uh, warmth and, and, and happiness. Because, because even though people were being killed and so on, there, you, you were actually alive there. I think the COVID thing, um, when you get right down to it, I think it was just it's a little bit less boring than it used to be. Somebody, I wish I'd written this guy's name down because it was one of the best quotes I ever heard, but it was some, something about weird. There's a conversation going on about uh, the, the, the prevalence, especially a couple of years ago, of all of these zombie things, uh, zombie apocalypse, apocalypse movies and Walking Dead and Discovery was doing things like Afterman and what happens if, the, if all the humans left and how long would it take for everything to decay? I love that stuff. I, I do too. But, but the reason we love it is because it, it puts us into a crisis situation. The reason Walking Dead is, right. or, or a zombie movie is, is fun is because you put yourself there and you say, could I survive? Would I be willing to take this guy's head off with a shovel? For me, the answer is yes. But <laughs> what, this, what this one person said was so interesting. This person said, when all of adventure has been bleached out of society, the only adventure left is to destroy the society. And and I thought, man, that is really, that really, is really onto good. something. Yeah, really onto something. When when you look at the history of civilizational collapse, it's always from the top, always. It's never the soldiers on the wall. It's always some guy in silk robes that comes out at midnight and opens the gates. You know, the, the elites get bored. They know they're decadent and, and they, they end up with this death wish. And that's fine with me. I just don't want to go with them, you mm -hmm. know, but, but they're determined to just throw open the walls there's you know there comes a point when when and we're there, really it, reaching so this point inside deep within them they're creating the crisis that they sense will make them feel alive again exactly so let's say you've spent the last 10 years with everything you could possibly want which is certainly true for relatively wealthy people in america uh and, and so, I mean, let's just paint it as broadly as we can, right? So you're sitting there on your golden on your golden couch, and you have and you have you know slaves peeling grapes and dropping them into your mouth, and you're and you're saying, oh, let's perhaps let's fillet a few thousand Christians. I might find that amusing for a few moments. <laughs> and 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 you're just constantly trying to up the stimulus so that you get some kind of a response. Right. Comes a point when when the only thing left is to watch it burn. And, and I'm not in favor of watching it burn. And so everything that I do and everything that you do is trying to talk to other people who don't want to see it burn, fighting back against these elitists who I don't think they fully aware mentally that they want to see it physically burn. Although, although you walk the streets of Portland, Oregon, you might find some evidence to the contrary there. But, but when you have people who are this bored, then, then they do self-destructive things. And, and this has happened and this is why civilizations take 200 years to build and, and two, well, 20 years to destroy, right? Because there comes a point when, when that human desire for conflict, we have it built into us. If we didn't, we, well, the ones who didn't have uh, the ability to fight are, aren't with us anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we have to raise, we have to raise little things to the level of, uh, of threat. There's a term for this. I've forgotten what it's called, but basically, we're wired to be worry machines. And if we're not going to worry about the leopard right. coming through the door, then we're going to worry that we got the soy milk instead of the almond milk, but we're still going to worry to the same level. Right. We are not really 
poets by creation. We are survival machines. And the, you wake up every day and job number one is, okay, don't die. That's it. Right? And then if you don't die that day, then we can talk about mating. You know, maybe we'll work on, you know, getting a roof over our heads and maybe we'll move to some place with little easier resources to get a hold of. But first, don't die. Who wakes up that morning anymore? Nobody. You know, it, you, you don't that way in the morning anymore. You don't. I, you know, I get up and I, I have this. I have a bunch of things that are outside the periphery of my thinking that are sort of dread like oh taxes oh i gotta deal with that you know i've got to get this fixed but nothing that's really you know about to get me you know, and i used to joke that i only move forward when something is gaining on me. <laughs> and that's really the, the sort of the truth about me <laughs> well, it's, it's perfectly reasonable and no you got it right and, and the reason you start worrying about the reason you get like a sick feeling about taxes is because built into your um into your biology is the survival instinct to worry about things right and and if it's not going to be guys with spears or tigers then it's going to be taxes or it's like i say you got latte soy latte instead of the instead of the almond milk and and and, and you know you, you know you start throwing it against the wall and you can't breathe that out of people the, right. there there must have been humans that didn't worry about things and they're the ones that didn't post a guard on the on the mouth of the cave you know they're they're leopard food now they're not with us but something and like so, taxes is such a poor substitute because the only dread i'm feeling comes from the fact of having to do monotonous work and then give away resources yeah you know i mean normally you would do you would be doing um adrenaline producing work running after something and killing it the best part of your day would be spent with blood running down your chin literally well, and still you would is then, for me you would then yeah i know but you're a little different than the rest and then you would be dragging that carcass back to share it with everybody and be a king for a day uh, now that's a world that my brain understands my brain doesn't and, understand and, this world and it's a here. world and it's a world that that the progressives brain understands too they just deny it. And and, I, and I'm, I'm glad we come back to this because I, I've thought about this an awful lot. And, and you know, the ideas you have to be most careful of are the ones that you that, that feel the best, right? The ones that the, the ideas and the philosophies and the beliefs that make you most comfortable are the ones you need to watch the most carefully because that's, that's where the trap is. Mm. But I've really kicked this one around a lot. And when I really get down to it, Dave, I, I find that the fundamental difference between people who are either strongly conservative or strongly progressive is is cowardice it, it it's just it's really cow and most of it is physical cowardice hmm. and and i wish it was something more sophisticated but generally speaking it's not if you look at the mask situation the COVID situation from the beginning conservatives were able to look at the at at the, when i say look at the data i don't mean they went to the website when when I say conservatives looked at the data, what they did was a month into this thing, they said, how many people do I know that have died of COVID? Right. How many people do I know that have gotten it? Well, I know four people that have gotten it. Three of them said it was a bad cold. One of them was in the hospital for a while. And 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 you just kind of parse out the level of the threat. Right. And, and you put it into perspective and you see, well, there are very, very few young people dying and all the rest of this stuff. And you go on with your life and you understand that life is risk. But if you're one of these people who is just terrified of everything, then this is a, this is a, 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 a this is like an amusement park ride for you. This is like a moment, you know, this is your, this is your, if you're a natural, I hate right. to say it this way, but I can't think of a better way to say it. If you're a natural born coward, a world where everybody is supposed to be afraid is your that's your ballpark, man. Right, the world has right. just conformed to your personal sense of, of um, ethics and values and, and skill sets. And that's why I think half of the country doesn't want to give up the masks. And, they and, like the fact that everybody is afraid. And since you uh, are ideologically already always being set once one remove or more away from the actual picture, you mm -hmm. then you you're not going to dig into it and really do the risk assessment accurately. You're just going to very much welcome the the wolf at the door feeling that it's giving you and the 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 idea that oh I can do these rituals and that will save me and my and my neighbors. You know, you're literally killing millions by taking off your mask. <laughs> you know, you're, you're I'm, actually not. I'm really not literally killing millions, but no, I might you're really know somebody actually not. gets somewhat sick. Maybe you know, if if you were to to devise a worldwide pandemic and based on the trying to come up with the kindest 
possible pandemic you could imagine, it would be COVID-19. No, and, and, it, it and, doesn't and kill I suspect the that's not a coincidence. It doesn't kill the young. It doesn't kill the productive. It I kills suspect that's not a coincidence. Like, like my dear mother is 93 years old, and she's been basically in a care home for 10 years, and her body doesn't know any better. It just keeps breathing. There's, there's her productive years are behind her. She doesn't know what's going on. And we're basically warehousing her. And if she were to have been taken by this, by this illness, it would have been her dying of old age. Something will get you when you're 93. And, and basically most of the people died, did, oh, did, did die of this. They really died of their comorbidities. And this just- That's right. They wouldn't have lived. Them most over of the, the people who died of COVID wouldn't have lived another six months anyway. This is right. Um, and, and by and the so way, that, 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 the, the world's that last economy. paragraph, could, I just could have written it myself. My mom's in the exact same situation, 10 mm. years in a nursing home. She's being warehoused. That's exactly right. And, and more important, and look, when I talk about assessing the risk, in the case of COVID, I, I made a good risk assessment. If, if this had been yellow fever, and there, and there were, and by the way, when this thing started over a year ago, they locked down California, I want to say March 18th of 2020. That's when Governor Newsom locked right, it right. down. And I remember thinking, OK, are we going to start seeing bodies in the hallway in, in hospitals? Are we going to start seeing shrouded bodies outside of hospitals, out, out, out in the parking lot? If that's the case, I'm going to treat this thing a whole lot more seriously. But we didn't. And, and that is just the ability to look at the data. If this had been yellow fever, I would have a very different attitude towards masks and all the rest of it, but it's not, so I don't. And and I really do think there's something to this idea of if you're a person who is who is just naturally afraid of things, then you don't want to see the end of a world where everybody is afraid, where, where you are mandated to be afraid when there's a government mandate to be afraid. For, for, the, for the year and change that the COVID pandemic has been here it's been a coward's world and and it's That's been a, fascinating a world uh, uh, framing of this and i haven't really thought about it that way so thank you for that it's, it's been a coward's where it's been it's been a world of enforced cowardice right it, it's 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 um so, coercive so, cowardice and and whether you think it's a threat or not you will wear the mask because if you don't you'll be hauled off and you'll lose your job or whatever so so they they like this they're normally afraid and now everybody's required by law to be afraid and when and when you listen to rachel maddow and the rest of these people now that people are at the point when they said you cannot maintain this fiction any longer we're dropping the masks they're in a near panic over it because now we go back to brave people and, and cowards. I'm and seeing and it, there are people who never want to give up the masks. I, I'm seeing it uh, 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 sort of on the outskirts of Los Angeles now. I was uh, Sunday, I was up at a, at a blues jam in uh, Newhall, right? And it gets a little bikery out there. Yeah, right? no, it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely yeah, blue collar country. It's kind of like there. Biker Carmel. It's a b uh -huh. little, bit of a, a <laughs> little bit of a hip thing going on the, down on the boulevard, but oh just God, really for only one block. And so we're out there on the sidewalk and, and people just don't know. Some people are still masked and there's a little awkwardness, a little social weirdness going on, at least for me, because I've been living in Altadena here and, and my neighbors are mostly liberals and they really adopted it. And we have this ritual where I'm out walking in the evening and so are they and everyone just, oh, I'll walk out in the street so you don't have to, you know, and this weird extreme distancing. But. Now I, I'm going to these places like a blues jam. Blues fans are the least frightened people you know, right? Yeah, because they, they're already pretty much they, they down see, and out and battered. They figured they don't have. A, it's, not only do they not think they're going to live very long, they don't think there's any reason to. Right, and they seek out a roadhouse for fun, you know. Yep. And and so they're they're not masked. That other people that are, are are masked, and there's all this awkwardness, but it is beginning to break finally. I yeah. think, don't you? Oh yeah, and 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 if we had been a rational society, it would have broken eight, eight, nine months ago. Right. When when the hospitals didn't overflow, that's when we should have said, okay, we did the smart thing by being careful. The two weeks to flatten the curve made perfect sense to me. But after two weeks, when there was when the curve was flattened, we should have said it's not as it's not as fatal as we thought it would be, or might be, or feared it would be. We we we. We did the smart thing, which was we we went further than we should. Now we're going to start letting these uh, restrictions release, so that once look once an airborne flu type virus is out, it's out. It's not going anywhere. Right. It's going to be with us forever. And 
And we should have just been letting the air out of this thing slowly, 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 so that we start to build up the herd immunity and we never exceed the ability of the healthcare system to treat not only the infected people, but the people who are having a heart attack in the middle of a pandemic, right? right. As long as there were hospital beds available, we should have been letting the air out of this slowly, which is why Elon Musk took uh, Tesla out of California because he basically they, they said you're going to yeah. shut down your factory, and he had a he had a graph. He said, "Here's the predictions, and here are the total number of occupied beds in hospitals. This is real. That's a projection." And Don't you hate people that follow the science. Ah, oh, man, I um I do. I, yeah, I, well, I, I want to ask you something. Sure. Get, I'm beginning to feel more and more like we shouldn't be seeking to annihilate our liberal friends like some people on my channel do. I mean, they, the idea of, of talking to those other people, you know, oh, my God, they, they, they want nothing to do with it. You know, I think we should start feeling like we are a liberating army. We are trying to liberate them from the sort of uh, Stockholm syndrome within which they live their whole lives. Yeah. Because I, I'm sure you're like me, you know plenty of liberal people, they're really nice people. I've got, they are. I have neighbors over here, the sweetest people. And I know they didn't vote for Trump and wouldn't ever, but, um, but they're really good neighbors and good people. And they are intelligent people as well, but they have to live within this make-believe world. And it, it, we, our job is to liberate them. So we, how do we, how do we get how do we get that done you know i think the best way to do it is just by example um well as these waves started coming in even i want to say it's about 10 years ago i started doing some colleges 10 years ago i started really got the sense of stuff that's really starting to hit ahead now mm -hmm. and when i was doing i haven't done colleges in seven eight years and i'm i'm, I'm not going to live long enough to do another one um but back then when you could start to see this stuff coming and all of this hostility, I thought, okay, so my job here is to basically let people know what conservative principles really are, you know, what, what it is we really believe. And I, I rapidly realized, no, that's, that's not it at all. What I have to do is I have to convince these people that I'm a human being, that, I, that, I'm, that I'm a person who's not like us, screw them. That what, they're, they're, they're poor people, let them die in the gutter like dogs the way they deserve. Turn them into, right. into you know, into um, uh, Soylent Green. This is what they think about us. And when they hear that they're, when they hear you talking about real, you know, real issues with compassion and concern and, and, and want other people to do well, just that alone is enough to hit the reset button for, for a lot of them. So I think we should just go out and live our lives. I, I've said it so many times now, but it's like, we're the people who believe in, in fast cars, loud guns, and hot women. How do you not sell this? How <laughs> incompetent do you have to be to lose to these weenies who are talking about sitting around in thatched huts over burning dung piles, you know, picking fleas off of each other and raising money for the Guatemalan water snake? You know what I mean? They're, 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 they're joyless people, Dave. The, the thing I did this morning was, was about narcissism and stuff, and, and the quality of narcissism is – an absolute lack of sense of humor, utter and complete lack of sense of humor. There's no fun. There's no joy. There's no laughter. They can't. They can't take a joke. They don't know how to make a joke. They can't. Uh, they can't, especially, 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 they cannot ever joke about themselves. Uh, Stratosphere Lounge is the worst produced show on the internet because it's the worst produced show on the internet. I have to do it by myself. I'm usually late in the day. I make all kinds of mistakes. I've done almost 300 of them, and I still make the same mistakes because I'm because I'm kind of lazy and because part of me doesn't really care. But but you could never hear a, a, a narcissist say that this is the worst produced show on the internet because it would reflect badly of their image of themselves. I'm not worried about other people's image of me. I have, I have my own image of myself. And so I can play with this. I was talking about um, my friend uh, Nick Searcy is an actor who was in Justified and he was the, Tom Hanks' friend in Castaway and so on. Um, and, and the reason I love Nick Searcy is because Nick Searcy always refers to himself as international film and television personality Nick Searcy. <laughs> and international film and television personality Nick Searcy has a, as a, as an adopted son who's black, but international film and television personality Nick Searcy never talks about that because he doesn't need to he doesn't need to 
use his adopted son as a prop so other people would feel better about him. He did trot him out in one of his YouTube videos about uh, about acting school. And he trotted him out so that he could show himself shooting baskets with him out in the backyard as a warning to the people who he was giving the acting classes to that too much time with your family will take away from your career. Don't make this mistake. Do not sit out there and shoot <laughs> basketball with your kids. Get back to promoting yourself. And 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 so when you can make fun of yourself, that's an indication that you have the ego strength, right? The sense of character to, to be able to throw a little mud really? on, on you. Nothing is more winning than a little self-deprecation. And I think this this is one of the things where uh, our former president failed is he would – it would be so easy if he would just have come out once in a while and just said, you know that thing I said the other night that sounded so so dumb? Sometimes I say dumb things. What I really meant was this. And then go ahead and say the thing and you go, that's kind of charming, you know? And he wouldn't do that. He would just say – He couldn't. I mean, look, he's a narcissist. And so so was his predecessor. And so was his successor. And 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 the only president that I'm aware of that didn't have that was Reagan. And I know it's easy to worship Reagan. But one of the reasons that people who, who really understand what he was saying think so highly of him was because of his lack of narcissism. The, the most important thing I ever heard about Ronald Reagan was uh, was written by Peggy Newman Newman back when she was you know mm-hmm. rational and <laughs> and she said she was talking about something that Obama had said and she said the idea she was a speechwriter the idea that Reagan would ever tell the American people what they should be doing was simply beyond his comprehension right. his job was to go to Washington and be the president of the people they would tell him not what to do and not the other way around and I thought, yeah, that's that. That seems mostly to be true. Um, and and you and remember when a, he when, when he uh, was in the the debate uh, with Walter Mondale, and uh, and the questioner asked if he thought his age might be an issue, and he said, "Well, I would never make my age an issue. I don't want to capitalize on the relative youth and life. experience it, of yeah. my opponent." And and you see the camera sh- shoots past him, and you see Mondale over there just laughing and so and and you just see this this grin on on uh on, on president reagan's face and, and that's when mondale, he, that, that was that was it because his said, age had been an issue up until right. that instant and mondale said that was the moment that he knew it was all over for him he yep. knew he couldn't win can't can't beat it thanks for watching if you like this video subscribe to our channel and then click the little bell to get notifications